Okay. Welcome to our worship. As we prepare our hearts, hear these words. Waiting for you, O God, you will come as surely as the morning, bringing hope, forgiveness, and redemption. Will you join me in our call to worship? Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that we might serve you with reverence. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in God's word I put my hope. Israel, put your hope in the Lord and in God's unfailing love. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. Let us pray. New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors and all your creation, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Waiting. What does it mean to say I'm waiting for God? Surely God is here, wherever here may be. We come to church or to Zoom to this time of worship expecting God to be present, but somehow I'm waiting. Am I waiting for a certain feeling or a particular hymn or a prayer or a scripture passage? Am I waiting to be filled with a presence? Do I come with joyful anticipation? or anxiety, because I know I fall short, as Paul tells us in Romans. And as I'm coming, what do I bring? For surely if I'm going to come into God's house, into God's presence, I must bring something to offer to this God of my salvation. So what do I bring? My heart, my hopes, my fears. Am I able to acknowledge before God my shortcomings and failures? Assuredly, she already knows. So I'm waiting. But am I just passive, doing nothing with an empty mind? Maybe sometimes. Sometimes waiting is that quiet, meditative state we generally associate with contemplation. It's that place in time when we attempt to look deep within our being to find God patiently waiting for us. But what about those times when I can't quiet my mind? when it's racing around and around like a hamster on a wheel, when I don't seem to be able to settle. Well, that may be the time for praise and adoration, or perhaps a line from a familiar psalm will surface and start echoing in the brain like an earworm, trying to find its way to the heart. That happened as I was thinking about today's reflection. Our psalm for today is Psalm 130. And I know it best from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer as the De Profundis, which means from the depths, taken from the opening words of the psalm. But what came to my mind was the last verse as found in the Book of Common Prayer. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. I really like that plenteous redemption. I love that word. It says basically the same thing as every other translation I looked at, but this is the version locked in my memory. So it has a resonance and a feeling. So here in this penitential Psalm, we have these great words of hope and praise, as is true for all the penitential Psalms. No matter how bleak or what depths we are experiencing, there is room for praise. So as I watch for the morning, the dawning of the knowledge of God in my life, I can always remember God's everlasting love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace, and give thanks. For to me, praise begets joy, that deep, sure joy of God's never-ending love for me as a beloved child, but also the love of God for all her children, for all are made in her image. So as I call out of the depths, I remember as I wait, and I take joy in that deep knowledge that God is there waiting for me to
to send me forward on the path of response to that love. Will you join me in our prayer of confession? O oh God of compassion, if you kept a record of our sins, who could stand? We come before you with our brokenness and our wounds for all to see. We bring our anger, our bitterness, our unwholesome talk and our deceitfulness. We try to do good, but sometimes fail. We choose to do evil and sometimes succeed. Keep your promise to forgive us when we confess to you completely. Without you, we have no hope. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear now these words of assurance, my friends. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and will forgive us. God provides freely in the bread of heaven all the mercy we need for life everlasting. In the name of Christ, know that we have been forgiven. Amen. Robin. Good morning. We'll be reading Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Allie? Actually, it's going to be me, Jane, because uh, your pastor did not get all of that done. And so Allie's looking going, what? <laughs> oh, I have it up. I have it up, Alana. I did. Oh, okay. I just couldn't get right. myself unmuted. <laughs> I got there it. You go. It's all right. All right. So the reading is going to be 2 Samuel chapter 18, verses 5 through 9, and verses 31 through 33. The king commanded Joab, Abashi, and Itzi, be gentle with a young man, Aslam, for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. The Israel troops there were surrounded, were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule kept left on going. Then Cushi arrived and said, My lord, the king, hear the good news. The lord has vindicated you this day by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked, Is the young man Absalom safe? Cushi replied, the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Thank you, Allie. Well done. Andy? 
The reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to the end, and then uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing rather than them labor and work honestly by their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, and, but not only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has, forbidden, has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And I would like to share with you what is recorded in John. Actually, it's a continuation from last week. And I'll begin by reading the last verse that I read to you last week from chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then taking, going down to verse 41, we find these words. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Amen, amen, herein ends the reading, and I would like for you to join me in a word of prayer. We come before you this day, O oh God, your community of faith, seeking that bread that will nourish us eternally. We come before you, O oh God, aware that it is through your grace and not what we are or what we have done, that we can receive such bread. You come into our lives and you bring life abundantly, a life in which we can come to you and say, we see you. We see you in the many, many joys and blessings you bestow upon us. From the celebration of family events such as anniversaries or birthdays, from the community getting together to celebrate things such as festivals and yard parties, from the camaraderie that exists within your community of faith. We thank you for all of the blessings, pointing to us to the one who loves us so abundantly. And out of that great love, you beckon us to bring our burdens to you. 
of those who have lost loved ones, those who are remembering death dates, those who are hospitalized or soon out of the hospital but still recovering, those with health issues, those traveling or about to travel, and issues that will be resolved when they get to their destination. And most importantly, I guess, oh Lord, are those, those unspoken concerns that lie within our heart that we cannot even verbalize, but we know that you know them. And we know that you want us, desire us to place them before you so that your healing mercy can be applied. And so we give them all to you, O oh God, with thanksgiving in our hearts. And we say to you, continue to nourish us and strengthen us. As we end this prayer, we end it, O oh God, with the words your son taught us when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I think one of the many reasons I like to close the pastoral prayer with the Lord's Prayer is I don't know about you, but I find a great deal of hope and joy in that prayer. And also, I think it's a good way to focus as we chew on what um, the Lord has laid on my heart to share with you this week. If you've had a chance to listen yesterday, you got a snippet of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about this continued theme, basically of where we go to find our nourishment. Not only the uh, good veggies and all that other food food, and I'm happy to report so everyone can call Laura Brill that she said she was gonna give me some green beans this week. <laughs> and my Aunt Toogie is coming to visit and you have made her day because she believes a visit to her sister requires green beans and taters for dinner. And you have made that possible. Thank you, thank you. But I digress. I want to talk with you today about the three passages of scripture that we have and how they really do speak to us of where we get our nourishment from. And then even more so, how that nourishment is reflected in what we do and don't do. Now, we've had three different scriptures uh, to look at. We've had the scripture from 2 Samuel, which was really snippets from two different points. We had uh, scripture from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus in which he was basically reminding them, you are a new creation now and you need to act like it. <laughs> and then overlying that, overlapping that is Jesus's word about the bread of life. Jesus in chapter six reminds us that he is just that. And for those who were listening that day so long ago, referring to himself as the bread of life probably resonated within the crowd who were gathered there because bread was such a vital part of their diet. But Jesus was saying to the crowd gathered that day as well as to you and me today, that he is the only one who can satisfy the hunger that lies within us. 
And just as a gardener enriches the soil with various nutrients so that the produce grown become lush and bountiful, and we so enjoy eating those green beans and potatoes and other produce from our gardens. He's saying that the words and the acts that we perform should reflect the nutrients we receive from the bread of life. You know, as I was writing this, I thought, you know, if we do sing, they will know we are Christians by our love, do they not? Or do we not? But let's look at the scriptures that have been read today through the prism of how our words and deeds reflect our faith. The Old Testament lesson that was read is full of pain. Even though Absalom is rebelling against his father, David, King David, David, as that parent, still wants to protect him from the foolish choices he has made. But to get a better understanding of what is going on here, I'm going to backtrack for a while. True, he made some pretty bad choices. But Absalom had a sister named Tamar. Absalom and Tamar were David's children by one wife. His first son was um, Amnon, A-M-N-O-N. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. He was by a previous wife, as I said. And so Absalom and Tamar and Ammon were half brothers and sister. And Ammon had a thing for Tamar, and that's putting it mildly. He was obsessed with her to the point that he raped her beautifully, be badly is what I'm trying to say. In an age and a culture in which such an event would have ostracized her and, and just completely in some ways um, destroyed her. Absalom was furious with his father because the king did not do what Absalom thought he should do to revenge such a horrible event. And so Absalom bent on revenge hating his half-brother for the dastardly deed that he had done to his sister whom he loved greatly. Continued to feed on that hatred and that anger and it boiled over to the, an event in which Absalom and a couple of his buddies got together and they killed Amon. Absalom decided his father should not be on the throne. And I'm certain part of that rebellion was based on what he considered to be his father's failing in protecting Tamar. And so he planned a revolution, a rebellion. And it is at that point that today's scripture was read. And David, knowing that the rebellion is taking place, sends orders to his commanders, protect Absalom, basically. I know what he's doing, but he's my child. That didn't happen the way David had hoped. Absalom, riding on his donkey, is ensnared in a limb of a tree and David's warriors come along and kill him. And the house of David becomes a house of sorrow. Sorrow based on responding to the humanness within rather than the divine, which was readily available. Feasting not on the spiritual food offered by God, but by the food of lust, of revenge that would lead to death. That old saying, we are what we eat, comes to mind as we reflect on this passage of scripture. 
and David is left desolate. Allie read us the end of that. David crying out, Absalom, my son, Absalom. How I wish it were me who had died. Absalom, driven by anger and hatred, allowed those feelings to guide his life. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. I'm going to change gears here. We see, have seen what happens when we feast on that which is unhealthy and destructive. Paul continues that theme in basically in the letter that Andy wrote the read the portion of in which Paul is saying, you really need to look at your feelings that develop into destructive habits. Church, remember who you are and whose you are. We are called to imitate God, to put away foul words, lying, cheating, gossiping. Not only do these habits weaken the church, Paul tells us they sadden the spirit. We are called to be compassionate, kind, and forgiving. We are called to be imitators of God. That's a pretty high calling, isn't it? The Reverend Derek Weber, actually it's Reverend Dr. Derek Weber, writes in Discipleship Ministry the following. Being called to be imitators of God places a high calling on the people, and it's difficult to imagine a higher calling than that. But this is why we must spend most of our lives in the process of knowing God. And in order to do that, I would challenge that it has to be a lifelong process. Yesterday, I had the honor of listening to the Reverend Waller lead the funeral service for Buddy Elliott, Miss Mildred's brother and Sharon and Donna's uncle. In a way, Reverend Waller was affirming today's scripture. He talked about Buddy as he referred to him throughout the eulogy he gave. But he was also talking to everyone present at Giffen's. How one values family, friends, and God reflect the lives grounded in faith was his theme. Honoring those in our lives by how we talk to them our willingness to help, the joy and simple pleasures, all of that reflects lives who, that are being fed by the living bread and the waters that satisfy as nothing else can. Those words struck a chord within me, primarily because I'd pretty much finished with the sermon for the week. <laughs> So when I got back to the house, I tweeted it a little bit. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time refraining from feeding the beast that lurks within me, that humanness, if you will. And when I fail, and I'm here to tell you I do that quite regularly, not bragging, but just being honest, I go to the bread of life and confess that I can be a narrow-minded, selfish person, desperately in need of God's grace. And out of God's greatness, I am once again cleansed. Not because I deserve it, but because I serve a God who is gracious, quick to pardon a person who is truly penitent. We read of this grace throughout scripture, of David bowing before God and declaring it was God alone against whom he had sinned, 
to Paul telling the church of Ephesus, you are a new creation. Act like it. Shake off those old habits. To Christ, inviting you and me to partake of the bread that God alone can offer, the bread of life. Our challenge this day and every day, I believe, is twofold. First, we are called to deepen our relationship with the God we serve so that we might come to know God a little better than we did yesterday. Christ reminds us that we have to abide in him if we are to grow in grace. Second, we are called to demonstrate with our words and our deeds that the source of our nourishment is the bread of life. Yes, every now and then we'll take a big piece out of that Hershey bar of life that the world offers, but our true nourishment is from the bread of life. And I believe with God's grace guiding us, we will become closer each day to being that imitator that Paul challenges each of us to be. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Oh, good and gracious God, how we want to just chew on the bread of life. And as we want to, we also recognize that sometimes we feed other places. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you that you continue to use us. And so at this time and in this place, we give back to you a portion of that which is you have bestowed upon us to be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask your blessings on it. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. At this time, we are going to have a wonderful hymn. I don't know how many of you know it. Gather us in. Here in this place, a new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space, our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly, give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters. Call us anew to be salt for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. But here in this place, the new light is shining. 
Now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones. Thank you, thank you. And so I give to you, my friends, this benediction. Go forth and live as Christ in the world. Speak and live with integrity as you journey through this new week, knowing that God will satisfy your every need and lead you to a victorious life. Go now in peace. <laughs>